walking virtually along the world's most revered footpaths and connecting the global community of pilgrims. It's the Sacred Steps Podcast, available on YouTube and your favorite podcast app. Broadcasting from the Shamer Studios in Florida, here's your host, Pilgrim, Backpacker, and author, Kevin Donahue. Glenn Camino Pilgrims, and welcome back to the Sacred Steps Podcast. I'm Kevin Donahue. On today's show, we're walking virtually alongside Father Johannes Schwartz, who joins us from his hermitage in the Alpine regions of Italy. Father Johannes recently completed the Via Alpina, during which he visited more than 200 Catholic shrines throughout the Alps region. His pilgrimage is the subject of a new documentary film entitled Via Alpina Sacra. We'll preview that film and discuss his pilgrimages to Jerusalem, Rome, and Santiago on today's episode of the Sacred Steps podcast. Father Johannes Schwartz, welcome to the Sacred Steps podcast. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me on. Father Johannes, I have to start um, because you're our first priest joining us on the Sacred Steps podcast. So I traditionally ask everyone to share with us a little bit about their pilgrimage story. And so as an ordained priest, I'd love to hear your pilgrimage story. You actually, you also uh, asked me to dress casually as you when I got the, the <laughs> I general did, email. Indeed, yes. I, I tried to sort of uh, uh, dress casually. In a way, this is actually this is a a, a pilgrimage a pilgrim's outfit. Um, it was blessed by my bishop when I set out to Jerusalem, and I now use it uh, in the Hermitage, in which I spent most of my time. But um, the, it, this this is actually connected with my very first pilgrimage. Not the same garment, but I. I went on my first pilgrimage when I was 20 years old. I had been walking all my life. I enjoyed walking. I had a great grandmother who was walking until like like multi-day hikes way into her 80s. And so I have fond memories of being on the road, of walking in nature, being outside. I grew up in the country, so I, I was always sort of out in the woods. And I've always enjoyed walking, but the first real substantial pilgrimage I did, I did in, in, in a cloth like this, in a pilgrim's outfit, because I'm a hopeless romantic, um, which means that when I, I had this idea of, of walking to Santiago de Compostela, which was really what I did in, in 1998, internet was barely invented. 
and there was little information that was really useful uh, on there for me. And I did, you know, I, I sort of cut out a 50, kilo, well, let's say a 30 mile range corridor from Austria uh, to where I was born to uh, Santiago and then, you know, put on a vestment like this, which my mom made for me in, with a sewing machine following some pattern from a, a carnival costume. Um, and then I had my rosary and and then I, I didn't take a backpack, no money, and I just headed out. And so the experience of this first pilgrimage was so amazing that I, you know, I, I went on many more. And so you, you did the Camino de Santiago as a theology student, and then you were in Liechtenstein. Now you're an ordained priest. You said you're living in a hermitage uh, uh, some of the year. You're in Italy now, right? Yeah, I'm I'm in the Alps, so I'm in the mountains. Uh, I can't walk outside the door at the moment because there are three feet of snow that have freshly fallen. Um, so I have to dig myself out uh, in the coming days and when I have to go to the valley to hopefully find some place where I can find food. Uh, I still have, you know, I, I, we are in lockdown here as well. So I've stocked up and I've been hunkered in here for, for a few weeks. So, but I have to get down again at some point. So I'm in Italy in the Alps. Um, I don't know if, if people know the Piemont region, Turin is the city, the capital, and I'm towards the French border. 15 kilometers from the French border in the mountains. Your pilgrimage journey has continued over the years. And most recently, you embarked on a rather epic journey on the Via Alpina. And for those who may not be familiar with this route, we'll link it in the show notes below, as well as Father Johannes's uh, website and journey experiences. So check the show notes below. But you walked on the Via Alpina and connected this journey with some of the oldest and frankly highest Catholic shrines along the way in what you correctly dubbed uh, the Via Alpina Sacra. Right. There is the the Alps are, are a place where you know I've I've loved going on hikes and and I've been out in the mountains ever since I was young. So I really enjoyed. And, and I've lived in different parts of the Alps. I've, when I did my theological studies in an international institute, which is partially responsible why I can communicate in English a little bit, um, you have, it, I, I, it was in the Eastern Alps. It was in a, in a Cartusian monastery. There were a lot of American students, uh, friends of mine, uh, who, who went to study there, a lot of people from the East. So it was an international community. So I lived in that part of the of the Alps in the East. Then I, I served in a parish for nine years in Liechtenstein, which is a small principality, has a prince and a castle. Um, it's a really small country, 30,000 <laughs> inhabitants. Um, lots of people put their money, basically. It's between Austria and Switzerland. And I studied in Switzerland. I did my doctorate in Lugano in the south of Switzerland, the Italian part of Switzerland. And now I, I have a hermitage in, in the Western Alps in Italy, close to the French border. So I've, I've lived throughout these, uh, these, these Alpine uh, landscapes. And, and the beauty of the Alps really is, is it's, it's a bit different. I've visited my friends in the States and I've um, taken a road trip from California to Minnesota, um, which usually resulted in the question whenever people asked me where I was going, I was going, uh, I said, I'm going to Minnesota and people asked me why. And I said, I have friends there. And they said, they must be really good friends. Uh, it was in the summer, it was humid. And the mosquitoes in Minnesota, are like about this, the state bird in Minnesota, I was told is a mosquito. So uh, it's, a, it's a really out in the prairie. This is, this is where I went. And, and I went to all the national parks in between, did a lot of hikes um, in the Rockies and, and Utah, beautiful, beautiful landscapes. And in the United States, you have this wilderness that is really a wilderness. Even the peoples who used to live there or still live there in, in, in parts, uh, the ancient inhabitants of America, they, most of them lived in a culture that was more, it was more, how do you say, um, mo mobile. Um, it was a culture that was not sedentary. Uh, and, and therefore, the remains they left in many of these landscapes are uh, a few and so you you can go on long nature walks you can go on thousands for thousands of miles in the u.s and just be in wilderness while in in in, in europe everything throughout the centuries and the millennia has really been a combination of human inhabitants and and um, and nature and the alps are an amazing 
backdrop and 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 well, not backdrop. It's it's really a, um, a scene that is to be, you know, cherished and 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 a, a sight to behold. The mountain landscapes, but they've also always been inhabited. Uh, the mountains are between the mountains. You have valleys, villages. You have high old mountain passes. You have people in in ancient times crossing these. You had the Celts. You had the Romans, and for two thousand years you had Christians who lived in these valleys and who shaped these mountains with their culture. So you have local shrines, you have crosses on, on, on the tops of mountains, you have churches, cathedrals, monasteries where people sought to to you know withdraw to these wild places to be in the silence with God. So you have these these hermitages, you have all these places of culture and of religious significance. And so the Via Alpina Sacra was that, that I, I sort of experienced in the Alps throughout my life gave birth to the idea to follow the, the main uh, the main idea of the Via Alpina of the Via Alpina, which is a network of trails across the Alps, um, and connect all these little shrines and make it a Via Alpina Sacra. So we talked a little bit um, when we connected earlier, and you come from. Um, an art background. You have an eye for art and you've been a bit of a filmmaker. And so your journey through the Alps became a documentary film. Um, and we'll, we're going to share some segments with our video audience today. So if you're listening on the podcast on Apple or Google, make sure you jump over to YouTube. We'll not only connect the channel for Father Johannes, but we'll be showing some clips from the Via Alpina Sacra documentary that Father um, Johannes filmed during the way. So this is eight countries, about 2,700 miles that you're walking. You're carrying your sacraments, you're carrying everything you would need for an Alpine hike, uh, and you're carrying some film gear to make this documentary, to share it with the world. So I would love for you to tell us a little bit about the journey itself, but I also want to take a moment after that, and I want to ask you about creating this visual uh, landscape as well. So first, walking the Alps. You, you're familiar with the region. Um, were you familiar with these shrines, and how did you find the the destinations and the shrines that you wanted to visit? Because there are many, as you said, sacred spaces throughout the Alps. Right. So I was familiar with um, some of them, some of the largest ones that I'd visited before on on shorter trips. The largest shrine in the Alps is in Austria, in the Eastern Alps, Maria Zell. It's a shrine that is visited by about a million people each year. So this is not um, a tiny thing tucked away in the, in the mountains. It's it's a rather big basilica that has a lot of visitors and popes have gone there. So it's it's a big shrine where people during the Habsburg um, uh, Empire years, people from all over the Habsburg Empire went also on foot, partially from Poland or from uh, other places. So there, there are... Um, there are these places that I, I already knew that I visited many times also on foot uh, in between shorter pilgrimages a few days. And and then there are there are shrines that are um I basically spent a winter with Google and and um, some other tools and and I, I just marked all the shrines and then I attempted to connect them in a line that sort of followed the idea of the Via Alpina and yeah I sort of visited about 220 of them um, there are many more it's just not possible but even if you look at the route that I ended up taking it's I, I came to one end the, the the other end of Austria and then I basically walked back all the way so I could then um, hit South Tyrol which is um, now part of Italy but German speaking and, and historically connected with Austria but that I could walk through the, that, that whole region that has a lot of sanctuaries and a lot of places so it was the first the first step it was planning really or was planning um, I, I, I enjoy doing pilgrimage routes that are not the beaten path I've, I've done the major pilgrimage sites I've walked to Santiago to Rome and to Jerusalem but um, I, I, I generally try to, and I, I've followed some of the historical routes, but I, I very much enjoy looking at things to see along the way, as I think 
in ancient times, pilgrims, why did a particular path lead in a particular direction? Why did it visit a particular area? Because there was something to see there. There was a shrine there, there was a monastery there, there was infrastructure there, or there was, yeah, very often it was, for example, there's um, on the Via Tolosana, which is a way of St. James in France, uh, you have a monastery, which when it became famous because of a particular saint, it just naturally diverted all the pilgrims that then went there to see that one place along the way. So similarly, I, I looked at what would be possible to visit. It was a bit tricky to to sort of think about this whole thing because the Via Alpina as a pilgrimage uh, route and as a, as a regular hiking route is only 1600 or 1500 miles long. And it, it, it has 180 stages. And fast people can do it in 80 days which is almost three months if you have some rest days, but then you have a short weather window. You have the Alps as, a, as, a, as an area where you, you, you climb up to 10,000 feet or more, which in, in the Rockies would be no problem because it's a, you, know, you, you almost start at 10,000 feet in some areas. But in, in, in Europe, it means that you have a short weather window. You can basically, the earliest you can start is in June and you have to try to try to finish by September, October and get to lower elevations because otherwise the snow will just lock you up and, and you won't be able to, to cross. So there were some um, considerations that, that, that went into it because of the terrain I was hiking. Also what would be possible without a special gear. Um, I did cross a few glaciers, but I had to sort of make sure that there was glaciers that I could cross alone without technical gear. And um, so for, for example, when I wanted to reach the highest chapel in Europe, which is at, um, sort of along this uh, up up the, the flank of Monte Rosa, which is, uh, I have no idea, in, in feet, it's 4,500 meters, which would be about, I think, four, fourteen or 15,000 feet. Um, and so so you, I had to go up there. There were, there were glaciers. So there, there are, the weather is really an important factor to consider when you crawl, when you walk in the Alps. And it was not clear in planning whether it was even possible to walk the entire length of the trip. So that was some of, of the other aspects. So you have, to, you have the places I wanted to visit and the places that I hope to visit and then the reality of what would happen along the trail. Dolomites, these, these gothic type mountains framed a, an, an, an amazing backdrop to, to many of these ancient and old churches that I, uh, I visited. There was a lot of Romanesque style, a lot of gothic style that is so rich in symbolism and has layers, not only layers of paint, but layers of meaning that can be discovered. And, and I very much enjoyed South Tyrol and, and discover its, its ancient heritage. We're talking with Father Johannes today about his new documentary film, The Via Alpina Sacra. We'll link the film itself as well as his website in the show notes. So please check those out uh, as you have the opportunity, because this is a, vi a visually beautiful documentary. And I, I want to ask you, because there are some aspects of this where 
you know, obviously you can't plan the weather, as you said, and there may be some sites that you have along the way, but you're carrying your camera gear. And did you just find inspiration along the route and decide, okay, now I'm going to shoot a little video. Um, this scene, you know, it, it, it touches me. It speaks to me. How did you, how did you go about the composition of this documentary? The documentary itself is, is really sort of, a, um, it's it's a cut to to sort of tell the story in ninety minutes. Uh, it's ninety three or ninety four minutes long. Originally, I, I brought the camera gear not for a single documentary, but um, the idea was so so I'm a priest, and and some people might already be wondering. So this guy is walking a lot. What is this bishop saying? What is what is the church um, saying about this priest who I mean doesn't have any other work to do? <laughs> um, so so it happens that I'm in a in a in a diocese, which is sort of the the, the organizational structure in the Catholic Church, um, where there are a lot, there's a sufficient number of priests. In fact, there are too many priests. So some of us work outside the diocese. And um, so my bishop um, agreed to, to my request of going to Hermitage and working on different projects of, of um, catechetical projects, which is really a sort of catechetical is a fancy term to, to say things that explain the Catholic faith. And I do videos on this. Um, there's a cartoon series about this. But the Via Alpina Sacra was not only sort of a, um, a personal journey, it, it was really a business trip, uh, in, if you want, uh, in the sense that I went out there to tell the story of these places and what they teach us about the Catholic faith. Because when you, when you visit a place you know, there's a statue that has a particular, there's, for example, you have a statue of of the Madonna and the child Jesus, but then you have a particular bird, I don't know what the bird is called in English, uh, sitting on the finger of, of Christ, and you go like, what's that bird? And um, and then this is a particular bird, and this particular bird is linked to the passion culturally and, and has been a motif in art for a long time. So you have a reference to the passion with the child Jesus. And so you have you have these theological considerations that you can go into and, and in the book that is was the, the uh, was more in the focus when I actually did the trip more than the documentary, but the book is not available in English. Um, I'm working on the translation, but it will be some time. Um, so when I set out, I, I basically set out to tell the stories. And I tell them in a book, and there was a second book project um, about pilgrimage in general all over the world. I was invited by some professionals to photojournalists to put in my meager photos and my stories of my trip, um, because I'm not a professional, obviously, um, as can be gathered from the footage I shoot or, or anything else. But it's, 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 I enjoy doing it, and I did bring the camera and, and the video recording footage to, to do short episodes, which I did in German, uh, where I did interviews at all these shrines and all these places and recorded um, myself talking about these places and then cut it with the, the footage of me walking to this place. So in German, there are 60 episodes that are about 10 minutes long uh, that, that sort of introduce all these different shrines and tell the stories. And initially it was all planned. I all recorded it on site. And then I got back home and I didn't have the possibility, I didn't have a computer with me. I didn't review the footage or anything to save conserve battery and everything. But I got back home and then I had this huge shock that <laughs> a lot of the footage I had recorded myself with was just unusable. Um, because when you walk for four months and you don't have a mirror and you don't shower as often as you should and your priest shirt, which is sort of a black thing with the, the, the white uh, collar, you know, the sun has bleached it out and, and you have food in your beard that I don't who knows how long that has been. You have a bird living in your beard uh, <laughs> that has made its nest. So there, I, I basically, I, I wasn't happy with the footage. It would have been very penitential to put it out there, both for me, because people would see what I really look like on the road and for people that have to watch it. So I decided to re-record these, these, these sections and elements in a uh, with a cartoon hog, uh, a, a wild boar, which is sort of a symbol for hermits. And so that's, I did this hermit and hog series and um, recorded this in German. So the, the, the video footage was for this. The documentary that is now available in English, I basically completed in English because I was invited for uh, an Alpine Association day on the Alps and they invited me to speak on this. And, and so I, I tried to provide them with footage and, and the possibility to, to share the whole journey. So that's basically um, 
what this documentary ended up being. It's the story told in the most concise, short way that hopefully gets at some of the both beauty, the suffering of walking it, the the thoughts that came along the way. I, I did interview sections, short bits that I, I recorded in towards the end of the trip, because towards the end of the uh, trip, I sort of had the idea of maybe I could do a film if together with the short episodes and and I got the abbot of, of one of the oldest monasteries in the West, which was the, the uh, final uh, destination of, of the trip um, um, on an island outside Cannes. Monastery founded in the year 410. I got the abbot to to reflect on, on or to give me his thoughts on some of the uh, um, some of the questions I had for him. And so I, I think it's a it's it's a well rounded, hopefully beautiful and interesting and inspiring um, film. It's not big budget or anything of of that sort. It's it's just an attempt to tell the story for a wider audience. Jetzt, wo das Wetter besser ist, habe ich mehr Freude, weil ich natürlich auch mehr sehe. Es gibt mehr Ausblicke auf, auf die schönen Seiten der Alpen. Ich bin dennoch müde ähm, und auch heute Morgen, obwohl wirklich ein schöner Sonnenaufgang auch war, den ich jetzt nicht gesehen habe, weil ich im Tal unten war, aber die Bergspitzen, die begonnen haben zu glühen, ich habe schon immer ein bisschen Heimweh ich, nach dem Garten, was da gerade passiert, nach dem Vertrauten. Aber ich, ich merke einfach, dass ich ähm, nicht körperlich wirklich extrem müde bin, sondern, sondern mental. audience who hasn't seen it, we'll link it in the show notes below because it is a, a visually stunning documentary and at times very, a very human story as well because you were incredibly honest in the interviews, the, the self-interviews that you included in the video because there were times where as a walker, um, as someone who's been on a journey for months, where you are questioning, you know, do I... Do I want to, do I want to walk today? You know, is, how do I feel? Um, and where am I on my faith journey? And you were very honest in sharing segments of that. And I wonder, you know, in looking back and seeing it, if it connects you as well to when you've rewatched it and you've looked at some of these segments of days where you felt, I really, I really don't know if I can do this today. And, uh, it was a very hard day or, or, or a cold night and, um, and, and taking you back to those moments along the Via Alpina. It, it does take me back. I mean, as, as you know, I mean, you have been on, on pilgrimages and you have walked um, in to many places. You, you see a picture and, and it immediately sort of, it, it reconnects you with, with what you've gone through and, and you, you sometimes you get the, the sounds, the smells, the, the visual things. Um, there's so much that, 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 that you live with. The, I, I did I did the interview parts in an honest way and which is I mean if I look at it I look at it in a, in a it's it's embarrassing in a certain sense you know I'm, I'm a priest so people go like oh so you're one of those guys who sort of you know pretends to be holy and I'm I'm not even very good in pretending so uh, I I just it's it's humbling in a sense to realize your own imperfections which for me is impatience and 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 under stress I I just I mean, this is part of why the, the life in the hermitage is so beautiful is, is because the factors of stress are really limited to very basic things. Like <laughs> there are some, uh, I don't know what they are called in English. Um, uh, small creatures live under my roof that, um, that um, yeah, it's, it's sort of a mixture between a, I don't even know, a squirrel and something else. Um, 
we call them seven sleepers in, in, okay. in translation. <laughs> it's it's Giro in Italian. Um, for those who want to look it up, it's it's a beautiful. It's, it's like a, a it has a beautiful face like a mouse and and a tail like a like like a, um, a squirrel. They live under my roof, which is a stone slab roof, and they live there and they sleep for seven months. Um, that's how they got their name. And so they're quiet now, but uh, in the uh, summer and, and fall, one of them just really, um, just, you know, just places himself outside my door on the balcony, which the door is always open uh, in the summer to let in the air. And um, just, it, it screams in, a, in an odd fashion. Uh, it's, it's not very pleasant. And so th- this is really the most stressful thing that happens here in the mountains. Um, <laughs> that's good for me because I, I'm... Patience is something that I, I work on and um, that I need to work on. And it's something that on this trip in particular, there was a lot of stress from the weather because in the Alps, you have you have in the early, early part of the season, you have a lot of thunderstorms. And if, if you've ever been hiking in Colorado or if any of your listeners have, you know, in the summer, you have these, there is like clockwork at three o'clock in the afternoon, I believe it was, uh, or thereabouts, thunderstorms come. It's like on a regular, almost every day, you can count on it, but you can basically walk up until 2.59 and then you should get off the mountain and then there's a thunderstorm for two hours. The storm, yeah. Right. And, and so in the Alps, it was a bit, it was also almost like clockwork, but not really you know, it came every day, but you didn't know when it came. And you have to go over passes, you have to go over mountains, you have to try to reach certain points. And and so when you have the weather turning bad, what happens is, you know, you, you don't want to be on the top of a mountain when uh, lightning strikes or and when things go down all around you. Quite aside from the rain and everything else, there's just this primal human fear of, of, of being struck by lightning. Um, so... You you live with this this uncertainty every day, and it builds up, and then you have in in your mind you have really, you know, you, you, this is a trip that had, like most trips, you know, that we take the, the months of planning, um, or even just dreaming about what it would be like, and you look at all these shrines and go, oh, this is an amazing place, this is beautiful. You get there and it's just fog, you don't see anything, so you want to tell the story of this place, and you're like, I brought my camera for this, you know, I could have just take a picture of a white wall and that would have sort of been the same thing. So, so it, it, it is, there's this, this frustrating element, especially when you, when it's not just, you know, overcoming distance, but you want to tell stories, you want to tell beautiful stories. And sometimes you have to tell these stories that are not so beautiful. And I have a friend who is a professional filmmaker and, and he, he told me um, years ago that when he, he saw one of my films, he said, you're really a great home video home video maker which is not a compliment in the film work and it was not meant to be offensive or anything but what he, he tried to express was that i do what most of us do when we want to share something we we see something beautiful and we go like oh if my friends could see this, this is amazing look at the sunset this is gorgeous you know you take a picture but when you actually w- watch a film or you watch anything um you, you and with a protagonist protagonist or anything you you want to see the difficult times and you want to see them overcome the difficulties. Um, so you, there's something that connects you with with these bad times much more than with things that you can only experience secondhand as beautiful. Um, so the difficulties, the the obstacles, all of this, this is what is human. And so I, I've I've always experienced it, this on on most of my trips. Um, f- Funnily, I, I, my 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 fifteen month ret- return trip to Jerusalem had very few days. I had forty days of rain in the beginning there too, so it was really tough. Uh, but then I, I don't know, you know, for for eight thousand miles, I never had the thought of of this is bad. I, I enjoyed everything. There was also. You know, every you walk on and you across twenty six countries, you have new cultures. You have there's always something ahead that you look forward to. It was only on the way back that I realized that I was sort of saturated and and I was, in a way, tired. Not physically, but because the body gets used to everything, but mentally. Uh, and I was happy to return, and it was good. Um, but um, so in in a way, this journey because it was even though the mountains are always different with this wet and weather pattern that i had i did i did go through 
after the first 50 days, I, I just I said, okay, now I have to set up the camera and tell it like it is. And the German original is much, much longer. I just didn't want to bore people with subtitles uh, about that particular monologue about uh, why I'm very bad at suffering through something as ridiculous as 50 days of rain. And I even had chocolate at that point. So I wasn't really, it wasn't a hopeless case. I was, and I was under a, a, a pit, uh, there was sort of a garage that I'd found somewhere. And, and I just, you know, I was even in the dry, but I was just on the inside, you're just tired. You go like, oh, I want to have, I want to see something. I, I love views. And it's, it's just, you know, there's, there's little to see. There's things are not coming out the way you want them to for the book or for, or you at least think that this is, is, is not going to be the way you imagine it or for the videos. And, and it's just, you know, you ask yourself, why am I doing this? And then tell it to the camera. Perfect. Father Johannes, some of the moments that touched me most in the documentary made me realize that you were not just a pilgrim and you were not only walking this for the experience of pilgrimage, but you're a priest. And so you were, you were having Eucharist uh, along the way and you were celebrating your faith along the way. And, and you share that in, in the, in the documentary. I mean, yeah, as, as you said, I mean, I'm a priest. So when I do things, um, I, I try to do, do them as a priest. I, I do them not as a perfect model of sanctity, as has already been evident from things I've said before. Uh, but as someone who strives for something and and who naturally, because he's a priest and I try to be visually uh, recognizable as a priest, who who then gets to, you know, do ministry along the way. And, and there are different parts of it, really. There, there, so there was this catechetical aspect after the pilgrimage that I could tell the story of these places. But during the pilgrimage, I invited people to uh, send me their prayer requests, um, which really, um, I sort of I set up a website and people could, you know, send me their intentions. So somebody might have a father who's an alcoholic or a brother who is doing drugs or somebody's a couple who is hoping for a child and, and all of this. And so they would put in their intentions and, and, and then the computer would randomly assign a particular shrine to this intention. Um, there's, there's sort of a little program I did um, for their pilgrimage. And, and so at the end, I had about 10 to 15 intentions for every shrine along the way, which also helped me through some of the difficult times because um, sort of this might be um, your listeners might have all different kinds of backgrounds and also religious backgrounds. The, the Catholic idea is, um, you know, we, we, are, we are a communion of people. We are we all together in this on this pilgrimage on earth. Um, and so we ask each other to pray for each other and, and, and to intercede, you know, to, um, the, 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 it's a bit more complicated theologically now to explain the, the concept of love that bears difficulty, that has a, a, a value, um, which is sort of the, the whole idea of the cross is basically works that way. Love that is willing to bear difficulty and, and, and suffer is basically the, the the highest form of love that you can have. But for the Catholic, what is 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 bound up with it is that we in in our following Christ, we are sanctified by Christ's grace on the on, on the cross uh, by His love on the cross. But then we are called to join in that love and bear difficulties willingly and in love. And so sometimes when I had my my difficult mornings after another thunder, thunderstorm or something, and I, I would just you know, I, I knew, okay, so there's somebody who is having a lot of difficulties in his life and I'm going to try to take the next step of the way and every other step of the way until they get to the shrine for the particular person. But, you know, th the way prayer works and how it unites us is also in a way that it, it prepares us to receive that which is important um, because it changes the way we relate to God and to the world. And and so it's it's not always that the prayers are answered in the sense that I get what I pray for because I do this or that. It's that in in prayer I connect myself with God. I unite you. I, I sort of prayer is in essence the the elevating of the heart to God. And so by being close to God, my heart is transformed, and I realize what I really need and the things that I ask for that I really need if I receive them to use them in the right way. So that that's the whole sort of, that's part of the ministry. 
there are, there are some more, um, you know, celebrating mass at these places is, is something beautiful. And, and, um, you know, you celebrate mass at the highest place you can actually do it in a chapel. Um, you, you sort of, I, I say it in the film that you have sort of the impression that the wings of the angels are already, you know, touching your head, um, because you're that high up or it's the lack of oxygen. It could be also be that, uh, but, um, So I just got out of the Valley of Mondes, which is, is, is a valley in France. It's really the last place on, along my trip that, that is alpine, you could say. It's the last time I crossed the 2000 uh, meter mark today. Uh, last pass was 2700 meters. And I got into this Valley of, 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 of Wonders, which is famous for its petroglyphs. So for the markings in the stone from prehistoric time, there are also some from the Roman period. And a lot of them also from the modern period where people just, you know, couldn't help themselves and left engraved their name. And I've seen this so many times along this trip, people leaving their mark, people leaving their name on the outside of the wall or even in the attic sometimes in Auster, I could actually go up to the attic of the cathedral to see frescoes that are now hidden because of alterations in, in, the, in the church structure that were done in later periods. Uh, and even there you would find names and, and, and dates of people and I don't know why why we why people have this urge to sort of leave their mark do they want to leave something uh, that is not passing I, I don't know so a certain contrast to this is another thing that I found that people leave at places at, at all these churches and pilgrimage shrines um, many of these sanctuaries have places where they keep votive images that people bring that somehow illustrate that their prayers were heard It is quite fascinating to, to look at them and, and there, there are many different artistic styles. Some of them are, are quite well done. Some others are more naive and, and others are, you know, you might even have children drawing something and bringing it to this place. You have, of course, you have all the kitschy stuff in Italy, the pinkish and bluish uh, ribbons for the birth of a child. But you have all these stories and they all are stories of, of, of a person, but they're not just a name. They, they are all tied together in God and his action in the world, which is quite touching and quite uh, fascinating to, to look at all these testimonies of, of individual people who in their life had their prayers answered. For me, one of the beautiful things uh, on this trip was actually to discover these stories. I set out to tell the story of the sanctuaries and I found that there are many more stories to be told by just looking at these images and why people came here, why people brought them. And it all ties in to this one story that is really the story of God and the world. Those are beautiful Fun, moments yeah. within the within the the film itself. We're talking with uh, Father Johannes Schwartz about his documentary Via Alpina Sacra, which you can uh, see in the show notes below. I'll link the video site where you can rent or purchase the video because the proceeds from this film, uh, Father Johannes, also help one of the chapels along the Via Alpina in France um, at uh, at Mont Tabor. Um, mm -hmm. and the proceeds from this film benefit that chapel. What's your relationship with that historic chapel? Um, it's, it, it, it's one that formed a year before the pilgrimage when I, I, this is not, it's about, uh, I would say from the, the hermitage where I live, it's about, um, it's a three day March, um, which is how I got there. I, I walked for three days and I got there. Uh, I saw it on the map that there was a shrine and I went up there and then I saw in which dilapidated state it was. Um, it, it's at almost 11,000 feet and it has 
because of the permafrost melting with with uh, everything getting warmer uh the fundament the the, the, the how do you say it? fundaments the foundation found it thank you this is horrible yeah so my my english is is, is lapsing uh, well, so the foundation you, you speak Java, multiple yeah. language i only you know i i know english so well my italian i'll help really, you on the english is, side my italian is here <laughs> this is this is the italian uh you have to move your hands that's the that's the whole secret to italian um but um and then and then really lean into the in, into the vowels ah and then you're basically fluent and the italian, the, the great thing is the italians will know what you mean because they are really great at picking things up. Mm. Um, so this is a, a particular shrine that, that um, I went to. The, the, the foundations are crumbling and, and it has to be repaired. But this used to be a shrine that was on the Italian side of the border. But after the Second World War, the border shifted and now it's in France, but it still is under the care of a parish that is in Italy. So it's a bit complicated on how to restore it because you have to sort of, the Italians have to ask the French uh, officials and the French have a peculiar system with with churches because basically the Catholic Church has the use of the churches, but it it lost. Um, it, it basically they are owned by the state. The state has guaranteed that it will maintain the churches um, that are were built after I think 1917 or something. Uh, no, sorry, before 1917. But effectively, it means that the government only spends money where you have. Um, a, a touristic um, like Notre Dame, which sadly burned uh, last year, that was was something that you know the, the the government will take care of it because millions of people visit it and and money will be poured into it. But many many local churches, many small churches in France, have leaking roofs and it's it's complicated and nobody takes care of the chapel. And the Italians are willing to do it, but it's it's legally it's a bit complicated because it's across the border now. But this is Montabo is a, is, a, is a shrine at this elevation, which is is goes back a long, long time. We had sort of a, a, a glacier maximum in the 19th century when there was a lot of ice covering the mountains for I, th I think it was 200 years that the glaciers advanced. But in the Middle Ages there was a warm period, and and this is when this when this this chapel first was probably built. Um, with the name and the name of the surrounding mountains, it might go back to the time of the Crusades. So it might be 800 years old. And and to have as even a, a sign of civilization at this level of altitude is, is for itself is interesting and, and fascinating. Um, it's not the highest shrine. There's one across the board in Italy that is even higher. And there's also very old, goes back to the 14th century. But visiting these places, I saw the, the dilapidated state, but the magnificent place, and I said, so what can be done? And and I got in contact with the mayor and the parish priest there. And the parish priest is very old and, and a very good man. And I hope he's still um, going strong with with everything that is going on this past year. But um, so so I, um, if people want to watch the film, it's it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. It's three or five dollars if you rent or buy. But this money doesn't go to me. It goes. I, I'll forward it to the to the uh, bank account that sort of collecting the funds to restore the chapel. Yeah, a great cause to help restore the chapel at Mount Tabor. Uh, Via Alpina Sacra, the documentary film from Father Johannes Schwartz. You mentioned earlier that you've embarked on, this wasn't your first pilgrimage, you've embarked on several epic. You've done a pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela. Uh, you've done pilgrimage to Rome. And back five or six years ago, you did an epic journey across 26 countries, the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And I think there are a lot of Christians that want to make that journey and, and making it from home is a very important part and a very impactful part. But anyone that can make pilgrimage, uh, it's a very valuable lesson. I've seen photos of you making this trip and you seem to have such joy in the journey. And I, I, I hope that I'm reading that correctly because the, the foundation of your faith, it seems that you're celebrating it on these pilgrimages. And I wonder if you could just take us back to being in some of those moments of walking pilgrimage and whether it's a, whether it's a, a beautiful day or different aspects of nature or the people that you come across, it seems like you, you live your faith through your pilgrimage experience. 
Well, I mean, there's there's one basic thing I want to I want to say before that, which is the the word pilgrim um, is comes from the Latin peregrinus, which goes back to basically the one beyond the field. So it means the stranger, the one who is not from here. Um, the idea of pilgrimage is is as as a pla- as going to places as a stranger that are somehow connected with your true home, which is sort of the basic idea. That is, is an ancient Christian thought, and it's fascinating to read old pilgrimage diaries. Um, there is, there's one that I read by Hilaire Belloc, who, who walked to Rome from a place that he was uh, in, in, in France. And there are old ones from pilgrims in the fourth century that you can still read and trace their root uh, diaries of, of pilgrimage. It's the, the, the pilgrim desires to, to see the places where God has worked or has, has, has touched the earth um, to see with your own eyes. I think that's a desire that, that is, is very human. For me, Jerusalem is, of course, a, a very special place. And um, I was up to that moment, uh, I had done my pilgrimage to Santiago, which was an amazing experience, one in which I had only three days of rain. Um, you already can tell I'm a, I'm a fair weather pilgrim. Um, <laughs> And and I I don't mind even though I I my, I don't tan nicely I just get red but I I prefer the red to the wet, and um, so I Santiago was an amazing experience, and so when after nine years in the parish I received the possibility because I was a young priest who could take my uh, position, I received the the possibility of taking a sabbatical to maybe then return to the parish if if I was still needed if it didn't work out with the young priest but I knew that it was going to work out. I would be free for a new project. I, I then went on to to be vice rector of a seminary close to Vienna, but so I had a sabbatical, roughly fifteen months in which I I could, you know, do something that not many people get the chance to do it, um, even if they have the desire to do it. And it's not about a political question. It's just you know, how, how how can you take off fifteen months? It's the celibacy really helps uh, in that in that sense because or you find you have a wife who who enjoys walking, uh, but um, it's so so. I had this sabbatical, and then I said I want to recreate some of this this beautiful experience that I had in Spain. The simple life. I mean, you know, is as a pilgrim. And one of the the things I enjoy most, uh, and which is not so much anymore because I now my whole life is is more simple in a way. It's it's prayer and simple work and and um and yeah manual labor and, and other things but it's my life in a pilgrimage in a hermitage now is very simple but the beautiful thing of a pilgrimage is that you that that life becomes simple you it's it's eat pray sleep walk repeat basically it's it's it's, it's very simple you you have and and all the while you're you know, you, you leave behind some of the issues that, that, that sort of occupy your mind because you have a physical exhaustion, which helps sometimes the mind to be more quiet. Uh, you have engaging uh, conversations, people you meet, especially if you go to Santiago, as, as, as many people do. It's one of the most beautiful things of, of the Camino is, is, is the people you meet, uh, which is also true for a pilgrimage in, when you go to Jerusalem. It's not so much that you meet other pilgrims, you don't. Um, there are simply not enough people on the road, um, and and the particular route I took was not a traditional route in a sense. Um, I I walked towards Russia, the Ukraine, uh, Russia, the Caucasus. I wanted mm-hmm. uh, to visit uh, Georgia and Armenia, two of the oldest Christian countries. Armenia, which has its own little Vatican, if you so want. There is a Jerusalem of the Balkans, uh, an Orthodox uh, place. That I visited on my way back, Ochrit, in um, Macedonia, and so there is, I, I, don't, I don't, many different places that I wanted to visit uh, along the way, and um, so Jerusalem had this, 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 this many encounters with the, the people that you meet along the way, which is is, is charming because you, the people probably have never seen a pilgrim and never will see one again in some Ukrainian village, not one going to Jerusalem because people just, not enough people do it and not through these villages. So a lot of the encounters and, and beautiful experiences I've had that I could recount have to do with these people. For me, one of the most touching things, however, was out in nature um, on, on the last stretch to Jerusalem, 
I walked through the Negev desert. So when I got to the, the Middle East, I, I couldn't go through Syria. Syria was a war zone back then. And I, I walked along the refugee camps in Turkey. And then again, when I got to Jordan, um, so I, I, I took a, a plane from an, the old Antioch, Adoron, uh, see, Antioch in Antakya, it's now called in Turkish, which is the first place that people were, uh, that Christians were called Christians. And it's a place where Peter and Paul both led the community. It's the place where St. Paul started all his missionary journeys. From there, it's to the Lebanon. It's basically just a, that that's a, a, a quick jump. And um, and then there's Israel. So I had to fly to Amman. And then instead of walking straight to Jerusalem, I walked down through the desert. Uh, Jordan has a lot of Christian sites. It has the places where the people of God went up with Moses. So there are a lot of archaeological sites that are interesting for a Christian. It's, if you want to, you know, very often people speak of the Holy Land and then they mean Israel. And that's true. But part of the whole land is is also Jordan, um, the, the the castle where my my patron saint uh, Saint John the Baptist, who had even a rougher beard than I did, um, he and he also he, I probably eat more Italian than he does. He ate a lot of wild honey and and locusts. So um, I went south in Jordan and then walked through the Negev Desert, which is also a place that you know prophets withdrew, the Holy Family went through, uh, but the Negev Desert is is one of the the emptiest places that you have in that area and you can walk and for 50 miles there's nothing else around no one else around and you find yourself lying there at night in this complete solitude and there's a silence that you do not experience anywhere else but in the in the desert the desert is you know when there's no sound there's no animal sound there's no water there's no there are no leaves rustling there's no airplane overhead there's it's just this this incredible silence but a silence that is not empty and and dead it's 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 a it's a silence that is full of a presence uh, and which i felt to be the presence of god so you find yourself looking up into the sky and and that has exploded into billions of lights and and you just lie there and 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 you have this incredible joy this incredible joy filling your heart uh, of this presence in the silence and that that is i think for me, one of the most touching things um, all, along the journey, aside from the the, the people they encounter, um, I, I was a bit afraid of, of reaching Jerusalem. I have to admit, because a lot of my journey was through, you know, different kinds of places, and I, I tried to stay away from big highways and, and and noise. and And I'd been to Jerusalem before, and Jerusalem is not a very quiet place. <laughs> that includes uh, Bethlehem and the place where Christ was born, which is just you know so many people come the holy sepulcher is it's just you know you don't only have pilgrims you have so many bus tours and tourists and everyone wants to just, just see this historically significant place and 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 i don't know if this is still done um i don't spend much time in cities but in my day you had like these when you had electronic shops and they had like 10 televisions on sale and every every television showed the same program basically and you sort of look at how each television was different um so you go to the hobbies holy holy sepulchre sometimes the same thing happens everyone puts up the tablet and you have the same scene in on a, on, on a hundred screens and and people are not experiencing things anymore because they stare at their screen uh, because they want to record it in a video that they will never watch again. So it, it, it is sort of, you have this, this, everyone is, and then you have the tour guides talking over each other and you have this incredible chaos of all these different religious rites. Um, you know, the, the, the Greeks are singing their chant and then the Armenians sing their chant, which is even more archaic. And then the Roman Catholics drown everything with the organ. Um, so there's this, this beautiful chaos it's a bit of like a kindergarten which is fitting i guess for the children of god but um it, it's 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 messy it's and i was afraid of of this especially after my desert experiences and everything but when i reached um jerusalem and first bethlehem which i reached in a in a after a, a hundred year snowstorm um it was quite incredible uh, i just you know i I'd come out of the desert with 30 degrees and then you walked into the hills of Judea and, and it goes up to almost 3000 feet. I mean, Jerusalem is about at this, at, at that height. And, and it was a, an incredible weather change. The snow came in and, and that also meant that I ended up at the, uh, in Bethlehem in, 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 in the grotto where Christ was born. The tradition has it that this is, this is the place. 
people were cleaning the snow and, and, and everything on the outside and there was nobody. I got there and for five minutes I was alone and that was like a miracle. And then I went on to Jerusalem and, and even the chaos, I, I, when I when I reached the Holy Sepulchre, I just, I just felt like coming home, which I absolutely did not expect. And I stayed in Jerusalem throughout the winter. I stayed there for almost three months before then continuing and walking back home. We're speaking today with Father Johannes Schwartz. Uh, his website contains some beautiful photography and images and storytelling from his pilgrimages to Jerusalem and the Via Alpina Sacra. We'll link those below in the show notes. Father, in the brief time we have left, I have to ask you, soon um, the snow will clear. Uh, <laughs> the, the spring skies will come uh, to Turin. And I want to ask, what are your next steps? What's coming up in your in your journey, either through pilgrimage um, or your next projects? In a in a in a world that is not um, still locked down by virus things, I would want to leave on the Via Columbani, which is a new pilgrimage route from Ireland to Bobbio, which is I'm not too far from where I live here in Italy. It traces the steps of Saint Columban, who was one of the Irish monks who basically made pilgrimage their life. Um, they, 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 they called the, these Irish monks who brought the faith back after the, the, the great migration, the, the Germanic peoples that came in, the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, the Irish monks really re-civilized parts of Europe, which is very evident north of, north of the Alps and they got all the way to the south of the Alps here in my region. Uh, and so I wanted to follow the, the um, basically the, the the journey of, of St. Columban and visit different monasteries along the way to talk to monks about what it means to live according to the virtues of St. Columban or any other kind of monk. And, and that would, would be a nice story to tell. It would be a long journey, about 4,500 miles or so, um, because it, it, is a, it does a gigantic loop in France um, to follow basically the place that, that to follow his journey. And um, that would be something that I was planning between April and um, November, October, November. But the way it looks now, it's not quite, I'm not quite sure if, if I can do it. I have alternative ideas. There's the uh, Via Sancti Martini, which is St. Martin's uh, trail, basically from Hungary to France. If the borders are open, I could start later. It's, it's a short journey. But St. Martin, for those who don't know, is, is a saint that is very often portrayed as, as a Roman soldier who cuts his mantle in half and gives that half to a beggar who then, in the dream, the next night he realizes, or he, Christ appears to him with that half of the mantle. My man, is mantle what do you call it? Yeah. Mantle, yes. Yeah. Mantle, yeah. I'm thinking of mantle piece and go like, no, no, that's something else. But um, so, so it's... It's, it's one of these acts of, of, of mercy. And there are, in, in the Catholic tradition, you speak of seven acts, seven, seven corporal acts of mercy. And I would want to explore the seven corporal acts of mercy. One of them is visiting people in prison. Uh, another one is feeding the, the, the hungry. So I would, I would cut up my, my, my journey, which is about 1,500 miles from Hungary to uh, France, and cut it up in, in seven sections and try to do to, to focus on one particular act um, um, work of mercy in in a section so I would I was invited to speak about my pilgrimage in a in a place where um, youth is like a prison for young people that are sort of separated from the general prison population to because of what they did there might be a, 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 an easier way out for reform. Uh, I was invited to speak at one of them, so that would be something I could connect with the trail mm -hmm. and the and the topic of the trail, the theme of the trail. So I would like to to explore both what it means to to try to recreate and live by these acts of mercy. So I have I have different options depending on how twenty twenty one turns out. I hope for all of us that um, our shackles. I don't know how Floridians are living through it. I think you have more freedom than other places, but uh, yeah. um, in in Europe. It's, we don't exactly know exactly what is happening at the moment, how long it will go on. And so I have different plans according to different scenarios as they play out.
Now they were behind me, the Alps, which over the centuries had received a Christian countenance. Churches, chapels, columns and pillars, crosses, monasteries, shrines, processions, traditions. A great diversity of such religious places I have visited in those 125 days. Old and new, some destination of the masses, others tucked away in remote locations. Stories not all full of glory and shining sanctity, and yet all expressions of a faith which in times of joy and sadness, peace and war, wealth and need, still seeks to show us the way. Artistic works made by pilgrims for pilgrims on their passage through time. This pilgrimage through time is not necessarily of the walking kind, as the life of the monks on this island proves, on that last small mountain in the sea. For it is less your feet, but rather your heart, that moves you on that more important inner journey. And so, over the past summer, these monks, in their cells, their ancient cloister, in their garden, and on their solemn processions around the altar, may very well have covered far more distance than I could have ever dreamt to do in my sandals and boots. Ordering things properly and letting go. The abbot, I think, is right that without God's grace that may prove to be a difficult task. Yet this letting go may very well begin with putting on your shoes, stepping through the door, starting out and realizing how little you need and that even those possessions on your back, in essence, are as fleeting as the heat of a summer's day and the rains brought on by dark black clouds. Fleeting is the rain, though a small little pilgrim may at times think it endless and far too abundant. You can follow the footsteps of Father Johannes. We'll link his journeys in the show notes and his digital routes as well with details on those epic walks. Father, thank you for being on the show with us. Be well, stay safe. Buen Camino to you. Thank you, Kevin. And I wish you all the best on your next pilgrimage and on the pilgrimage you're on right now, because as we all know, the true pilgrimage is not walked with boots on, but the one that is in here. So all the best and thank you for having me.